Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Claw Convos. Today, our guest is Pam Sherman, a lawyer turned actor turned entrepreneur and leadership consultant and someone who I've had the pleasure of knowing for the past couple of years um, and we're working closely with really um, someone who inspires people to help share their stories with passion um, and present and show up in the world um, with their authentic self. So we're really excited just to talk about what she's learned over her career and, and the different roles that she's filled. She's a best-selling author and columnist, also known as the Suburban Outlaw, um, and just has a very unique perspective that we are super excited to ask her some more questions and, and grab a drink and enjoy. Hey guys, this is Sheila and Maya Dunn, and you're listening to Claw Combos. <laughs> All right, welcome to Claw Combos. We are here with the Pam Sherman today. Cheers to that. Yes. Cheers. Um, so Pam, just to kind of kick us off. So I really wanted to talk about this transition from lawyer to actor and then launching your own business. Um, could you walk us through kind of your journey? Yeah, I'd always dreamed uh, that I was going to be an actor. Like that was the dream from the time I was, like a lot of young people I think are, don't know what they want to do. And, um, and I love those kind of people because that means it's a, the world is a clean slate, but if you have a vision of like, I'm going to do this, how do you make that work for real life? And that, that, um, I always saw myself as being on the stage from the time I was second grade. And this is a real story. I would play the piano with the door open wide, hoping that a wandering talent agent would hear me sing and cast me on Broadway, <laughs> which they don't do. Um, but I came from a very traditional family and my, my mother was a Freudian psychoanalyst and my father was an OBGYN, which was very confusing growing up. And to them, being an actor, even though they really included us in all these cultural opportunities growing up in New York City, was just that wasn't a career path. It was something you love to sit in the seat and be an audience member. So, uh, you know, when thinking about what to do after college, where I had majored in international relations and theater, I had imagined myself to be like, there was a famous star named Shirley Temple, who you may, may or may not know, who after her childhood career went on to become an ambassador. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that wasn't gonna happen. And uh, so I combined it and did a theater major. I think it it was um, it really helped me to have those two ways of thinking um, because what I really also was I love the intellectual pursuit of international relations and you know the study of history was really important to me so the natural course for me was to go to law school and I thought I would be an entertainment lawyer because. Um, I will never forget walking into my first civil procedure class in my first year of law school and the professor said, so you're all here because you want to be entertainment lawyers and you think that's doing coke with Mick and Mick does not want to do coke with you. He wants you to be a good lawyer. <laughs> so open your books. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that's very disturbing. I thought I was going to get to party with all my clients. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I ended up in law school, actually Barry Sheck, who's a very famous lawyer, um, you know, worked in the OJ trial, but more important, created the Innocence Project, which is an incredible, incredible um, institution and organization. He was really smart. He took all of the actors and put us into trial advocacy and moot court competitions because we could really act like lawyers. Uh, and then I went and started practicing law and it was nothing like television and you don't go to court like you if you do you're two years down the line and you're rolling the partner's bag or you're sitting in a document room and I was like this is not what I expected but I kept acting like a partner like that was really and I realized that people thought I was more senior than I was. Um, and the funny thing I started leading a double life in, uh, in Washington DC. Um, and I would go from depositions to auditions and, um, because there's a really rich, um, film, television and theater community in Washington, DC. 
and uh, partners would stop me in the hallway and say, was that you I saw in the Murray Stakes commercial or the Mercedes commercial? I'm like, no, 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 she just looks like me. <laughs> and, then, um, and then a funny thing happened. Like it got decided for me. My law firm went out of business. Mm-hmm. And I, I had this sort of inflection point. And if you think about it, a lot of entrepreneurs have that too. Like we failed. Do we keep going? Where, you know, what's the next path? And I, I kind of just took the leap. I, I had a bungee cord attached to me, which is, um, you know, a great teammate. My husband now of 39 years, mm-hmm. crazy. But my husband said, this is your chance. Go do it. And so I, I, I actually started, um, you had to, to get unemployment, you have to say that you apply for jobs. So I'd go to auditions and put on my unemployment form. And I went back and studied uh, acting in New York at the Neighborhood Playhouse and uh, at Oxford. And I became a full-time working actor in Washington. And that um, all of a sudden when your dream becomes your real life, sometimes it's not so satisfying. It was such a revelation. And don't you find that in even in the course of your business, like we have this big dream and it's like, this is not so great. Right? <laughs> we've got clients, we've got, right. Um, so that that's really the shift for me. Um, I will say I learned a lot from going, becoming an actor. And I mean, that's, you are an entrepreneur for yourself. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, right. As an actor. Yeah. That's the, that was, that's that story. And then there's like, I feel like I've had like three components to my, career because the second shift came um, after we moved to a city where there wasn't a lot of opportunity as an actor and I had to recreate myself again Mm -hmm. and became a writer Um, and then the recession hit and you know I had to while I've been living living a creative life I you know financially had to get in the game and so 13 years ago I created a company that really combined both the acting and the legal side and took me into this whole new entrepreneurial path. So what were, what was, what was Neil doing in DC when you made that leap of yeah. leap to become an actor? So that's the interesting thing. We're both entrepreneurs. Uh, he had literally, that's such a great question. Um, the <laughs> week that my law firm went out of business, he had been working as a VP of marketing, um, for a company that put frozen yogurt machines into grocery stores. And it was a model that was being proven difficult because of all of the growth in the hard pack frozen yogurt in the freezer. Like nobody wanted to do soft serve in in a grocery store. And they, the investors said, we're out. So the literally the week that my law firm put Oh my gosh, on April 15th, it was April 15th. Oh my gosh, wow. That's crazy. And we're recording this on April 16th, right? Um, wow, that's very, I'm very moved by that. He came along and he said, oh yeah, well, I've, I have this idea, you know, basically I'm out of a job, but I'm going to sell these, we own 1500 frozen yogurt machines. And I went to the investors and I said, I want to start a company so I can sell these in the aftermarket. And I'm like, we have a house that we have to pay for. We didn't have any children. Um, And I was literally lying on the floor of our house that we had purchased six months before, holding a stapler. I think I still have it that I took from the closed office and my coach leather bag, because I was a lawyer and I had a really nice bag, and wailing at the ceiling. And we had friends who were over for dinner that night. I'm surprised they're still our friends. Um, They're like, what are we going to do? We're going to lose our house. Um, and I guess I'm here to tell you, you do put every time you're in the ashes, your job as an entrepreneur, as a human is to rise up and figure it out. So he basically start. that's where his company started, which still exists today. Um, it's, uh, tagxbrands.com and they they work with, um, food service and hospitality, around the country, or actually some internationally as well, uh, in remanufacturing liquidation um, of, of equipment. Um, and that company still exists and has grown and grown and grown. So I like to say he was a visionary or a nut job and the jury is still out. Wouldn't you say that about most entrepreneurs? Yeah. <laughs> the jury is still out. Yeah. Yeah. So what, I mean, I did my research, but what are you doing now for our audience? And like, what, yeah, what, what would you call your role now? Yeah. So I, I work at the inflection point of uh, 
as a facilitator and a coach and a consultant, helping leaders present themselves and their stories with passion. Um, I work with teams and individuals. I get embedded into a variety of organizations, either um, typical Fortune 500 companies and uh, financial institutions, law firms, advertising agencies, um, marketers, which is really, you know, have to influence and lead um, and get followership in a, you know, to the rest of the organization around their vision and strategy for the products. And they have to do that with the tool that they have. And that really happened um, and that work started when I left the practice of law and I was profiled in People Magazine as somebody who ditched my day job to pursue my dreams. You now know the real story. The day job ditched me. And um, I got a call back then from the Department of Justice. It was the, you know, I had a training at the antitrust division. I recall that she said, can you help me make my lawyers more interesting <laughs> using acting techniques? I said, no, because I don't, wait, isn't your brother an antitrust lawyer? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> but I, I realized what makes a great lawyer. Their job is to persuade, convince, influence the decision maker using the facts and the law, that's their story, and they have to present it themselves. And I, I was like, oh yeah, I could do that because what's the job of a great actor? It's to persuade you, the audience, to suspend your disbelief, believe in the world of the play that they're creating, reach through the fourth wall, as we call it as actors, and grab your emotional attention so that you stick with it, right? You don't fast forward through the Netflix or you don't get up and walk out of the theater. Um, and that's really the work that I love to do is to help um, leaders be the best actors they can be by being authentically themselves, building trust and energy and inspiring their audiences to ignite them, to impact them and to empower them to lead. Right. That's the work that I get to do. Do, so people, much fun. <laughs> yeah. do people ever compare like acting to entrepreneurship or like where the layover is and like I don't know like sales like your description right then kind of reminded me of like a sales pitch almost like convincing your audience of to believe you kind of yeah and if you think about it and it's so funny because I'm I'm actually uh I'm working on the, the book uh about the work I do and for a long time I thought the book was just my work right like that I would or that it was a brand um but a book to me to pick up and buy a book where you, I could go step by step is a framework of what can I learn from this story that I can use in my own life and it, it, and yes the answer is an entrepreneur is has to share a story about the problem that they want to solve in the world and how they're the only person to do it. An actor in the business of acting is exactly doing that, right? Trying to convince the producers or director to hire them. But I think more meta and more interesting is the role of the actor creating a character in that play. They have to do all the work that you have to do as an entrepreneur to play the role that you're going to play in the world of the problem you're solving, right? I, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, completely. Right, so, you know, I was having this discussion with my editor and she's like, well, I don't really get it. Like, you know, isn't an actor playing someone else? And I'm like, well, we're all playing different roles, right? In the, in, in the state of your business, you probably have to put on the CFO hat and the marketer hat and the salesperson hat, um, but they're all still Maya and Sheila, right? They're all still you. But if you don't know who you are at the core, what your core values are, what's important to you, how they show up behaviorally, you can't transform yourself in the role to serve your audience. That's the, that, to me, that's the best analogy. Right. We, we talk a lot about kind of pursuing your passion and, and risk taking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I find it really interesting that you, you know, you had this dream of, to be an actor and then you realize that you didn't. Did you not really love it or what was it that you? <laughs> well, it's so interesting because I, you know, the name of my business is Sherman Edge, like I'm edgy, uh, but I'm actually, and, you know, I wrote a column called The Suburban Outlaw for 15 years 
and outlaw leadership is sort of the brand of the work I'm looking for, but I'm really a rule follower and I'm really a risk averse. These are aspirational goals for me. I usually am, you know, like I, when I say I got pushed off the edge and I had a bungee cord, I was screaming all the way down with my eyes shut, right? Um, I'm not a natural risk taker, uh, but then ironically looking back, I took all those risks. Yeah. However, the question was around, so what happens when you like wake up in your dreamed of life and it's, a, you've got to be okay with saying, this is not what I expected it to be. I didn't like that. I mean, I, I, I settled for how excited am I that I get to go and audition for two whole minutes. And that's like probably like a pitch, right? Um, where I get to do that for two whole minutes and they get I get to act because, you know, rarely do you get cast. When you do get cast, it's a, for a finite period of time. I was lucky to, you know, do a long stint in sheer madness at the Kennedy Center. But you're like, it's like you're a jobber. You're in and out. Mm -hmm. And I, and that's true as a consultant, but I like to deep dive into a world. And, um, and so there was that. And then there was, you know, there's some boring things. Like you sit around a lot on a film set, like, let's just be real. Um, and you got, and everyone's just going to love the process. There's a lot of not process happening, right. Um, uh, in the world of, uh, you know, creativity, and so how I, ca I, li I'm, I like things moving along and being always interesting. So, um, so maybe that was it. And then also, um, it's a hard life. You don't know when you're going to get something. And, uh, but I think it made me more able to take risk on later on in life. Right. Mm -hmm. If that, if that yeah. helps. And another, um, area that, you know, you obviously do a lot of speaking events and, and help people present with passion. So, and I think, you know, from knowing you so well, I, I know a lot of like the ways that acting comes into play here, but like, um, how do you, do you get nervous still? Like, do you- Oh gosh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> they, these are great questions, of course. <laughs> um, I love this quote that I, read some, and it was in uh, Time Magazine did a whole uh, issue on anxiety and um, good anxiety and bad anxiety. And there's a lot of anxiety right now in our world, but this was like certain anxiety actually can push you to be better. And it was a quote from a great actress. Her name was Sarah Bernhardt, um, just an incredible French actress who came and took America by storm, probably in the late 1800s, maybe that's right. But one actor said to her, oh, I never get nervous before I go on. And Sarah Bernhardt said, well, people without talent rarely do. <laughs> she would get so, she would get really worked up and was so nervous, she would actually get sick before every performance. And um, there are others who have shared that story like Beverly Sills and, yeah, I, I, I actually think when I stop getting nervous, it means I've stopped caring. And um, that anxiety drives, you know, look, I work with a lot of introverts. I mean, you know, thinkers, big thinkers like you guys. Um, and my job isn't to get them to act like me. It's to get them to feel comfortable to act like themselves. And if they're nervous, they've got to come up with some tools that will help them. But I also think it's okay to be nervous like it and and even there's an old trick where you say out loud right before you go on i am nervous it gets it's like throws it away hmm. i am nervous i mean there's lots of other tools but yeah i get nervous about content have i provided value just like here, you know, I mean, I, thank goodness. <laughs> this is, uh, although I, I did have one client who used to take a shot of vodka before she went on. I'm like, stop doing that. <laughs> Best to have your faculties in place when you're about to present in front of 12,000 people. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> so what, do you have advice for like the introvert that is trying to get better at public speaking or just presenting themselves? I guess like some quanti quantitative things to do or qualitative? Um, yeah, and it's funny, it's funny, Maya, they always call these things soft skills. And I'm like, um, these are the skills, right? Your ability to communicate to me. Uh, my definition of leadership is the ability to communicate a vision and gain commitment to it. 
So again, that's not about charisma. It's not about um, anything, you know, whether you're an introvert or extrovert. An introvert just gains their energy from being quiet and alone and thoughtful and the extrovert gains their energy otherwise. But for my introverts for whom public speaking might be a, you know, a, a, a challenge, and it's not public speaking. To me, it's um, how you show up and present yourself because, you know, especially as an entrepreneur, your customers are paying attention to you, your clients are, right, your clients for you guys, um, you know, the outside world of investors are paying attention to you. I think you have to, um, one, fully know yourself. Two, really spend time on your audience. What do they need and want? How do I prime their emotional pump? Physically, it really is good old deep breathing, doing some presence work, actually practicing. Um, no actor would get on stage without saying their lines out loud, moving, you know, having that. Um, and then there's, um, you know, really some mantras that you can do off, off stage that, you know, I am nervous, put it aside. My clients have a, an understanding of what it means to own the room in a particular way. Owning the room isn't, I own the room and you don't, like authoritative. It's I own the room together with you. So they understand that really, if, by the way, the virtual world has proven fantastic for my introverts because they're presenting to the camera that is the most beautiful attentive audience ever um and then you know some body language techniques you know deep breathing and then um i'm a big fan although there's been research that it doesn't prove to be true that doing a power pose for um it's supposed to be two minutes thinking of a time you were powerful releases the power hormone in your body, which they say is testosterone. I don't buy it. Um, but I go into literally go into a bathroom stall. And when I do my virtual presentations, that's a bathroom. I'm going back there <laughs> and I do it myself. So hopefully I think for my introverts, the most important thing I could say is planning and practice. My uh, high school running coach actually used to make us do a power pose for five minutes before every start of the race. Just stand there. Yeah. It was, I, I it, think there was going to be more testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, Did it work? I mean, yeah, I, I, I grew to like it a lot. I was like, yeah, all right, this is fine. I'm not nervous, but I still was generally nervous until it starts. I always find that I'm nervous, but you know, yeah. of forcing yourself into uncomfortable situations is. But that's it. We're always going to be in uncomfortable situations. It's how we react to them in the moment. And so you, it, it is important to plan for and have tools, but let's just face it. Once the rubber hits the mode, road, you know, in, this, in the race, or you're standing backstage in the dark and you're like, oh, there's an audience breathing out there and I've got to go in, or I've got to open the door and walk into a pitch room with a, or, you know, turn my Zoom camera on. Mm -hmm. um, there is that moment of, can I do this? And you have to answer to yourself, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. And that has to be an internal tape in your head that only you can write out. That's, I, I think that's the, the entrepreneur's dilemma is, can you change the tape in your head around fear, risk, and, you know, removing the word can't really important to, to create a new tape in your head. With that, like what, sorry, Sheila, I keep, Go ahead. Yeah. what would you say to like the fake it till you make it whole thing? So interesting. Um, there's a new HBR article written by a, I'm part of a, a network called The List and Cindy Gallup wrote this of like seven things young women shouldn't do. Like be more confident. Why don't you just be yourself? Like it was great. But she said the whole fake it till you make it thing. You know, I, I think you got to believe it as you see it. And uh, it's funny, I used to do this thing. Um, so I hope you know this movie. And if you don't, I'll describe it. There's a famous movie called When Harry Met Sally. And this scene 
uh, where Sally is telling Harry about um, how women fake orgasms. Uh, can I say that on this? Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, we're, cat's out of the bag. How women fake it. And so she starts to, as they're sitting in the Carnegie Deli, do you know the scene? Um, you know, and she starts to have the moment and it's perfect. Like, it's like a perfect moment. And it ends and there's silence in the whole restaurant. And he's watching this while it's going on in this other woman, they go over to take her order and he says, what will you have? And she says, I'll have what she's having. And um, I used to show that because I wanted people to say, you want everyone to say, I'll have what they're having. And then someone pointed out to me, you know, she was faking it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's a really good point. Um, because, you know, my answer to it is, but you would never have known. So don't fake it till you make it. If you have to fake it till you believe it, till right. you believe it. That I think is, uh, how's that? Can we change that concept? Very interesting. Wow, that's a great question. Fake it till you believe it. Yeah. Fake it till you believe it. Hey, I see a new meme for us to. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say I have t shirt moments, like, you know, that somehow like stick. To me, that's a, that, that might be a t shirt moment. Um, great question. Um, so some of, one thing you talked about is is kind of like the, the mental toughness, like having the ability to remove cans and um, just have this optimism and and yeah, like believe, you know, true belief in yourself. Yeah. Um, it kind of ties into women in leadership. And um, one of our last guests was talking about how we've seen all this digital acceleration and the pandemic has brought a lot of good and you know moved us forward in a lot of ways. but in, you know, she she brought up the stat and there's some studies that say like women almost moved back 10 years, like in a lot of ways moved forward 10 years. And then, so I guess, what do you, what, what advice do you have to women who may have suffered from this, this pandemic more so than men? Well, they not may have, statistically they have. I, I think it was like some, um, 47% of those who became unemployed are women. Like it's, you know, and then we look to, um, you know, black women and, uh, you know, diverse populations who have been truly affected. I mean, who owns small businesses? Who works in hospitality and restaurants? The retail, uh, you know, retail and, you know, there it's, uh, it is more women than men. And even if you're looking at the highest echelons, if you're looking at, oh my God, a homeschool my kids, I've got a, work all day and um you know all the things reshma sajani um who founded girls who code has put forth the uh, the mother's marshall plan um to try and address some of this and they're really advocating um politically for it uh what do i have to say to to women um ask for what you need from your partner ask for what you need from your community and um get back in the game as quickly as you can uh, we are still in the pandemic, and I think the world needs to settle into, let's also talk about the trauma that so many young people, women, children, we have to acknowledge the grieving process of what has happened. We, once um, we move through this, we can't forget what we've learned. Um, so I think it's to be good to yourself. And I'm not talking like take a bath and self-compassion stuff. It's ask for what you need, talk out loud about your grief and your trauma and make sure that your community surrounding you is lifting you up. And if they're not, find a different community. That's the, you know, to me, I, I can't solve this. This is going to have to come through some, through a, probably a bunch of policy initiatives um, individual caretaking of women who have left the workforce. Uh, but I will say I'm hopeful because sometimes 10 steps back will push us 20 steps forward, right? That's the, um, I, you know, I, I want to know what happened, uh, you know, after 1918. I want to know what happened after World War II and women lost their husbands, their sons, and what they did. Um, I, I have to believe that there are stories of women who have gone through um, global shifts and been able to move things forward. So I think we're going to find more dynamic um, act, activists 
around this issue. That's where women will, will rise. Yeah. I was, uh, I always wonder like if it's more of a societal or individual. I, I know it's both. It's gotta but, be both. But yeah, I, I really think it's also just who you surround yourself with too. I mean, you can't, sometimes it's, you might not be comfortable or confident to ask for what you want if you're not surrounded by you know, that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think, uh, so I'm on the board of an organization, JWI, uh, which our mission is to end domestic violence and um, sexual assault on campus uh, and to do that through advocacy and programming that grows financial literacy and leadership for women. And, you know, let's just talk about, you know, the domestic violence uptick, um, you know, when you're with your quarantine with your abuser how do you get out? So the answer is um, we have got to make this societal, make this communal, mm-hmm. cannot be up to the individual. Um, that's like, frankly, asking the victim to fix the problem. So I, I, I do agree that it's got to be both. Um, but I know that there's incredible strength. Um, I mean, women entrepreneurs rise and really, I, I, it just makes me hopeful for possibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, talking, I've, I've asked you this question, but I'd be curious, what is the legacy that you hope to leave? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I just lost my mom. Oh God, this is so sad. I think we need to take a drink. Let's have a drink to mom. Come on, join, join me. <laughs> and, um, I actually wrote about her legacy of the, being one of the greatest generation, and I never, she would never have seen herself as a feminist, but ultimately, like, she was a school teacher, married my dad, had four kids, but had a dream of being a therapist and went back and became a Freudian psychoanalyst. And even after my dad died, I never thought, I didn't think she'd be okay because, you know, she was 74. She flew off to Russia that year. Like, you know, she, she went on a blind date cruise to Venice. I hope that I leave that same kind of legacy for my kids of being a risk taker, of doing things that are that are fun and crazy, and then also having the gravitas to make a difference in the world. Um, I, I believe that we are here to serve um, others. It, by the way, that's a philosophy of an actor. Do so you think actors are all about themselves? It's not. They're all about the audience, certain service of the, the play and service of the other actors. So I suppose my legacy that I would like to leave is that I um, I brought energy to the world and left an impact for those lives that I touched. That's mm-hmm. it. And so, you, sorry, did I cut you off? No, I'm just a little moved by my mother. <laughs> she she was a lot of fun. Well, with your kids, like, are there trends or things that you're excited for for the future of like our, like our generation? Yeah, like the, you guys will take care of us. Um, <laughs> I, honestly, a lot of people lament, oh, we're leaving you with a hard world. I, I have a hard world. Like the world is, is a hard place, period. And every millennial, um, I'm reading a great book around this. It's called uh, Wonder Works. It's like about the invention of literature that have um, helped you to be a human in the world. And I got to tell you, like everything we've done, they were doing a really long time ago, just without the the technology was not as good. Um, My daughter is a senior and graduating and uh, she's in human capital management, but she's really passionate about women in sports and, you know, just her interaction as the president of sports business society. I'm really hopeful about um, what kind of leader she's going to be in the world in um, future industries. Like the path is great. And then my son is, um, He's a first year at Sloan at MIT and um, just the community of big thinkers uh, who are interested in um, business and management and how you do in data and the interplay of that. Um, and they're really cool and interesting to me. Like I, that's why I was so excited to do this with you guys, because I learn from the businesses that you've created around how to show up in the world. So, um, so what was the question? <laughs> It's about my kids and, and what I hope for them. I hope that they're just independent. That's, <laughs> here's what I've always said to my kids. You have to, and they laugh. They're like, and they change the words all the time. Like I'm like, oh, mom, you have to be uh, grateful, right? This is really important, grateful. You have to be um, 
loved, like put out love and be loved, right? I think that was it. I might have forgotten if the third one was to be independent because I'm not paying for you. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> not gonna be forced. Yeah. yeah. Be gone. Just go. <laughs> well, on like a more basic level, what what are like just ways for, for women in leadership positions? Do you have ways that you like organize yourself or like day-to-day operationally started your business? Yeah. I mean, it was funny because the kids were 13 years ago, I was in the thick of raising my kids and I did crazy things like fly off to, you know, I remember leaving them one April break and I'm like, I gotta go. I'm going to Beirut, Lebanon and Saudi Arabia for a speaking tour. See you in 10 days. Um, so I think most important is to help your kid, teach your, your, if you have kids to be self-sufficient, right? Like I remember getting a phone call from my son who was standing in Atlanta and he's like, what's for dinner tonight? I'm like, did you know I left to go to the airport this morning? I'm like, figure it out. Go figure it out. Um, there was a time I got locked out of the house and it was below 10 degrees below zero. It was like, that was a little stupid, but um, um, we fixed that next time. I think you have to, um, to operationalize for me, it's don't take on too much. That's really important. Be able to serve the clients that you serve. Sometimes you want to say yes, because like, I can do that. Um, and it's more important that you set a reputation of excellence. At least that's my core value and integrity includes an understanding of excellence. Um, and recognize if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to be doing it at all different hours of the day. You know, there's times when I'm, you know, up at midnight because I had a thought and I am writing it out or I've got to write a speech for a client or I, you know, have a team, you know, uh, group uh, that I'm facilitating and I need to do the work. Um, I would say what I wish I had done better is a better question. Like I wish I had gotten the help I needed a lot. I never scaled beyond me. I'm very much niche, you know, like the CEO whisperer, the senior manager whisperer, like, um, and I think a lot of people have gotten smart and hired great talent around them. Um, I outsource great talent and I get great talent to come to me in other ways. So um, when I started doing that, it just released me to be able to do a lot of other things. So assemble a great team with you, whether that's in-house in your company or externally through great, you know, consultants and partners that you can work with. That, yeah, team is a trend that we see come up in basically every episode we do of like creating your team. Um, What was one, one guest we had, I forget the exact terminology they used, but oh, the creating your fortress was the way he did it. Like the, the five to 10 people you surround yourself with, that's your fortress or people who, you know, challenge you, impress you, you think might be smarter than you, you know, that's, that's kind of, yeah. So that, that's so interesting. So to me, my network is so important to me. Like I, I have, uh, they serve very different reasons, you know, and they exist for different, like some are like business. Like I need to, I have this problem with a client. I want to talk this through with you. What do you do for pricing? I have joined more formal networks. Um, there's, uh, we're part of, uh, the young president's network and that just widened my horizons. And that's what gave me opportunities to go and connect to people in faraway places. And then I just recently joined a new network at this stage of my career, never stopped doing, I mean, this is so exciting to me to be able to talk to you guys, because I think we have to also create intergenerational networks Mm -hmm. that are, um, and then diversity of everything networks, like really, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about that for the nonprofits that I sit on the, um, you know, I'm really excited. I'm about to get involved in the national women's hall of fame in their induction weekend coming up in October on a leadership committee. And I was most interested in who else I was going to be sitting at that table with and how, um, and the people who are being inducted are amazing. Like, Michelle Obama, you can all go look it up, um, amongst others, um, you know, just ama- amazing when Mia Hamm uh, is going to be inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. So I, I, I feel like for join formal networks and, and then, you know, it's funny, I just facilitated this session about a speech that Abby Wambach gave and it's all about find your wolf pack. Mm-hmm. She's exactly right. But what's a wolf pack? It's your team. It's your fortress. Um, I call them, these are my people. They're my people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What was the, uh, networks of meaning? Yeah. 
Yeah, now I've got it. Now works a meeting. Um, I wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's critical. I mean, I had a, a, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. Like, even the nonprofit, like, where I put, where I was, I was very involved in um, an organization called Gilda's Club, which is a cancer support community, because that was important at the time. Then I moved to Young Women's College Prep, a char- like a charter school for all girls that I was really driven and behind. And then I moved my, um, you know, the Center for Youth is another organization that we're really involved in. But like, ph- even philanthropy can be part of your fortress, like you can make an impact and then connect to great people because they're interested in the same thing you are. I think every entrepreneur has the opportunity to give back in some way. If it cannot be treasure, you can give time. So that I think is a social responsibility starts with you. <laughs> That's another t-shirt. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Pam. This has been really awesome. So I'm glad we could, you know, take take 45 minutes and do Oh my that. God. Thank you for finding networks of meeting. I forgot I wrote that. Thanks guys so much for watching. We're gonna be releasing episodes weekly. Be sure to like, subscribe, all the other things, all the social medias. Comment, share, retweet, copy, paste, link. Isn't that the TikTok thing? Just full send it. Get it done. Get it done. Get us some likes, guys. Hope you guys enjoy.